Hello, my name is Johnny H. Flakes III, the pastor of the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church. Here at 4th Street, we do what we do for the love of God through Jesus the Christ. We are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Holy Spirit-led, and mission-bound. We are very grateful, and we are so pleased that you have been led to join us this day. Our hope, our prayers are that you will find this message helpful for your continued spiritual growth in the will, the way, and the word of God. God bless you, God keep you as our prayer. Welcome to our worship experience. Good morning, 4th Street family. These are your announcements for the week of Sunday, July 25th, 2021. Join us later this week, starting Tuesday, July 27th through Thursday, July 29th at 7 p.m. for our youth and young adult back to school revival. The guest pastor will be Reverend Paul Little. This event will take place in person. The emphasis is staying awake, taken from the scripture, Luke 21, 36. Also save the date for Thursday, July 29th at 5.30 p.m. for our Young Adults Block Party. Join us for food, fun, and fellowship, and a Q&A with Pastor Paul Little. This will be held in the church parking lot. Save the date for the 5th Annual Marriage Retreat to be held on August 13th through the 14th at the Marriott Hotel Uptown. Happening every third Saturday of each month is a community food giveaway to be held at the Civic Center parking lot. The start time is 9 a.m. and will be drive up only. Now through July 30th is the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church Summer Camp starting at 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. Breakfast and lunch are provided for children ages 5 through 12. For more information, please contact Sister Jackie Flakes. Coming soon in September 2021, join us for the Grow to Glow Women's Ministry Book Study, a seven-week study on Get Out of Your Head. Stopping the Spiral of Toxic Thoughts, a study in Philippians. Discover how to submit your mind to Christ, taking every thought captive, because how we think shapes how we live. More details coming soon. Save the date for Sunday, October 17th for Pink Out Worship Service in partnership with the West Central Georgia Cancer Coalition. This year's faith-based initiative theme is reducing the burden of cancer in the communities we serve. Learn more about cervical cancer and other forms of cancer at wcgcc.org. Happy birthday to all members born in July and congratulations to all new parents and grandparents. Join us for virtual weekly Bible study on Sundays at 5 p.m., Mondays at 11 a.m. and on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. with the exception of the fourth Wednesday. Join us via Zoom or on Facebook Live. For Zoom meeting invite details, visit our website at 4thstreet.org or contact the church office. Also join us for virtual church school classes. Spiritual transformation classes are held each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. for those of all ages. For church meeting invite details, please contact the church office. The youth ministry classes will be held on each Monday from 6 to 7 p.m. Join us for virtual classes including the first and third Mondays, Youth Advisors Bible Study, and second and fourth Mondays, Physical Fitness with Youth Officers. For more information, please contact Sister Sharonda Porter. Mark your calendar for these upcoming events. On Sunday, August 1st, is Communion Worship Service during both worship experiences. On Monday, August 2nd, is the Marriage Ministry Meeting at 6 p.m., held via Zoom. And on Saturday, August 7th, is our pastor's birthday. Also join us on August 7th for a prayer and meditation hour at 8 a.m. and the pastor's cabinet meeting at 9.30 a.m. At this time, we ask that you please direct your attention to the names of the members provided here on our prayer list. Please keep them and their families in your thoughts and in your prayers. At this time, we'd like to welcome and acknowledge all of our guests. We're so pleased that you joined us today and hope that you'll be led to join us again. May God bless you. If you're interested in accepting the invitation to discipleship, please contact the church office following services today. Please call 
2055 or email 4streetmbc at gmail.com. Tithing alternatives are as follows. You may mail your check or money order to P.O. Box 1591, Columbus, Georgia 31901 or use the finest drop box located inside the educational building. Please remember to wear your mask, or you may give online using Givelify. Please remember to connect with us through virtual worship service. Live stream held each Sunday on our website or on Facebook or YouTube at 745 and again at 1045 a.m. Or join us on Foxy 105 FM at 8 a.m. with our radio listening audience or on WRBL TV channel 3 at 8.30 a.m. for a rebroadcast of our services. We also encourage you to download the 4th Street mobile app. The church office information is as follows. Office hours are Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you have information for the weekly announcements, please submit them to the church office by Wednesdays at 4 p.m. God bless and make it a great week. Good evening. Welcome to 4th Street Live. I'm Brother Hardy, and I have Deacon Thorpe here with me, the chairman of the Layman's Ministry. And Deacon Thorpe, can you tell us what, uh, what the Layman's Ministry is all about? Well, the purpose of this ministry, Brother Hardy, thank you for asking, is to enlist and coordinate uh, the manpower of the church in the performance of Christian activities and to promote fellowship among men through study, worship, and service. Oh, man, that sounds like some good stuff going on. So uh, does the Layman Ministry have something coming up here in the near future? Again, glad you asked, Brother Hardy. Uh, the Layman are refocusing and ready to get started. We will meet the fourth Saturday of each month at, at 8 a.m. with the book, excuse me, with Real Talk for Men. Currently, the discussion is the book, The Measure of a Man. Okay, so you're telling me, so every fourth Saturday, at 8 a.m., the laymen's are going to have a Real Talk for Men here at the church. And right now, y'all dealing with a book called The Measure of the Man. Yes, sir. All right. That sounds great. So, uh, y'all seem like y'all got a whole lot of stuff going on down here at 4th Street. You know, Brother Hardy, uh, we do. The laymen right now are be becoming very involved. And uh, we are looking to increase our activity of the men and the boys in this church. We want to become a visible, viable uh, resource here. Uh, well, again, we're looking into uh, men and boys going out into the community. We will go and share the good news and touch on the violence in communities. We would like as many men in the church possible to be a part. And also, Brother Hardy, going forward, we will continue to have different activities for the men and the boys to participate, okay. again, like bowling, fishing, basketball, tennis, pool, etc. We're looking for men to come alive in the layman's ministry in the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church. Well, I tell you what, Brother Thorpe, man, you got me excited because uh, you, you mentioned some stuff that I really loved and enjoyed to do. And uh, the, the good Lord has blessed us with some great weather going on right now during the summer months. And uh, to the men out there that are looking to, you know, to mentor some kids and, and to give them some good Christian advice uh, from a manly perspective, uh, you don't have to be a father. Uh, you don't have to uh, have your own child. You can come out here and support us in any way in any of these activities because we could really use it. And Brother Thorpe, uh, I just want to let you know, uh, whenever you need me, just call me. I I'll be more than willing to help in any of these activities. Well, thank you, Brother Hart. And uh, we look forward to seeing all the men come out and participate. God bless. Thank you. Hi, we're back. This is Kelly, and Kelly's going to tell us a little bit about the marriage retreat. The marriage ministry retreat planning team has been working together to put together a marriage retreat for you and your spouse to enjoy and celebrate your marriage post COVID-19. Okay, so that's exciting. I cannot wait, awesome. but I have a few questions for you. Okay. All right, so I know it's going to be Friday and Saturday, August 13th and 14th, but what's the schedule? What are the schedule of events? Okay, great question. 
So we'll kick off the retreat with dinner at Hula Hands Uptown for you and your 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 boo or your boo bet, if that's a word. Know, bet. <laughs> um, reservations are at 6.30. And then on Saturday, we will meet here at the church in the Julia Fredericks Banquet Hall, where we will have six um, sessions that we will work through within the art of marriage. Okay, so that's exciting, but the bottom line, how much is this going to cost and what do we get in that price? Okay, perfect. So we'll have two packages. The first package is $129, which you'll get dinner for you and your spouse, couples material, which will include the, the book, the manual for you and your spouse, uh, which will include six interactive sessions. Um, we'll have fun icebreakers and games, snacks and lunch will be provided. If you already have the book, then from the previous retreat, then the cost to you is only $99 and you can't beat that. No, you can't. Exactly. Okay, so we're gonna talk, be talking about love yes, the entire yes, day. Yes, love. Okay, so what I'm hearing is, this will give us an opportunity to confront some of the common communication issues that perhaps we all have had mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Yes. And we will be equipped with enhanced communication styles and skills to be able to communicate more effectively with our spouses with a greater appreciation. That's absolutely correct. Okay. You can give through Give La Five um, by clicking the marriage retreat or use the envelope and write marriage retreat. It's that simple. Um, once that is complete, then you'll receive the pre-registration form. Okay, so it, it does sound simple and I'm excited. So just to recap, okay, the retreat, marriage ministry retreat will kick off on Friday the 13th with a dinner at Hula Hands Uptown promptly at 6.30 followed by a six hour retreat here at the church yes. on Saturday. Exactly. And remember only 40 couples. So please make sure you sign up if you haven't already. Uh, that's only three weeks away. So we pray that we see you there. Okay, so join us at the retreat to, to just start, start your marriage. marriage. Woo! Yes, yes. So, guess they have to catch me next Sunday. No, you can still get it. Huh? Yeah. How? Through Givelify. Give the what? Givelify. Give the who? Givelify. How am I gonna do that? Do you have a phone with you? Go to your app store and download Givelify. How do you spell that? G I V E uh -huh. L I F Y. Okay. Look at your church, 4th Street. Find the amount you want to give. Okay. Tap. Give. Done. That's it? That's it. Just that easy. Just that easy. Girl, I just gave the five. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you just did that. <laughs> Good morning. If you please, would you stand to your feet, please? This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is our call to worship. Before we start our devotion, period, uh, 
those that are live streaming, uh, Facebook, on the radio, we are delighted to have you join in with us because this is truly, truly the day that the Lord has made. Uh, our Declaration of Faith, sorry, our Article of Faith, number eight. We believe that the repentance and faith are sacred duties and also inseparable graces wrought in our souls by the regenerated Spirit of God, whereby being deeply convinced of our guilt, danger, and helplessness and the way of our salvation by Christ, we turn to God with unfinged contrition, confession, and supplication for mercy, at the same time heartily receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as our prophet, priest, and king, and relying on him alone as our only and all-sufficient Savior. Let us recite the covenant. Having been led, as we believe, through God. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we do not in the presence of God, angels and disassembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter the covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of His church, and in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote His prosperity and spirituality. This is a situation, or discipline, and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and greatly. family and secret devotion to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindness and acquaintances, to walk sex respect in the world, to be just in our dealings.
good it is for brothers and sisters to worship in the house of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we come at this time. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for another opportunity to come, stand, sit, and bow to say thank you for all you've done. And Father, we ask you at this time, if there's someone in this congregation, whether at home or whether on the radio, do not know you in the pause of their sins, they may come and confess Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, and every heart say amen. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is having a great morning so far. Today, we're going to talk about Jesus and how he washed his disciples' feet. And our lesson today is going to come from John, the 13th chapter, the 13th through the 15th verses. It says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. With it being hot outside, I'm pretty sure a lot of us are going to wear some sandals throughout the summer. Sandals are good because you can go, you can wear them just about anywhere and it feels good to have them on because it keeps our feet from getting too hot or sweaty. But just about those good things about sandals, there are also a few bad things. For example, how clean do you think your feet are after a long day of being in sandals? Probably not very clean because there's no shoe or no sock to block the dirt from getting out. So by the time you get home, your feet are probably really dirty and really stinky. In Jesus' time, they didn't have socks or shoes and people who could afford shoes wore some sandals. You can imagine just how dirty their feet were from wearing sandals every single day. And because their feet were very, very dirty, it was a rule that was established or made for servants to be hired to wash the feet of people who were growing inside of houses or different buildings. Now, do you think that the servants were pretty happy to be volunteered about doing that job? Probably not. Because who would want to wash about 100 people's feet per day? I know I wouldn't. They hired servants to do that because servants were considered very a low class job back in Jesus' time. So when Jesus got on his knees and washed his disciples' feet, it was a pretty big deal. Jesus was their teacher, their master, and the very most important person in their lives. They truly believed that he was the son of God. They dropped everything that they had and they followed him because of that. Seeing the man that they believed was the son of God and their Messiah washed their feet, sent a powerful message to the disciples, and it sends a big one to us as well. If Jesus, the King of Kings, could wash the feet of his own disciples, how should we treat our friends or our neighbors or people that we come into contact with every single day? Washing feet is a dirty job. It's one of the dirtiest jobs that you can probably do, but Jesus didn't find it too dirty for him. If Jesus was willing to wash the feet of people who were his followers, we need to be willing to serve others in the same way. Now, I'm not saying that we should wash people's feet, but I am saying we should find a way to serve others those who might be less fortunate than us, or even our friends in any kind of way. We could help them. That's what Jesus would want us to do. All right? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for setting an example by being a servant to your disciples and being a servant to us, Lord. Through your example, let us know that it is okay for us to serve others and help others in any way possible. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everyone.
how many can truly say you love Jesus more than anything anything else more than your son more than your husband your daughter your sister your brother how many can truly say you love him more than anything else you love him more than your health you love him more than your money your cars do you really love him more than anything else you and the radio listening audience do you love him more than anything else you and the live streaming congregation, do you truly love him more than anything else? And you sitting in the pew, we've been challenged through the song to really examine and evaluate, do we love Jesus more than anything else? It's more than just clapping hands and hallelujah, but it's about lifestyle. Is there anybody in the house? Worship is about lifestyle. It's about attitude. And, and we thank God for the corporate worship. And, and you ought to give him praise when you love him more than anything else. You don't care how people look at you when you end the worship. You don't care about how people may stare at you. When you love him more than anything else, you can't help but give him praise. Cannot sit there as if he has not loved you. Is there anybody in this house when you've come to the deepest understanding by way of the Holy Spirit how much Jesus loved you, you love him more than you even love yourself. Come on close. I love you, I love you, I love you more than anything else. So as we prepare to go to the throne of grace. We're going to ask if you remain standing, those that are able to stand. We're going to ask if you would stand. If you're unable to stand, it's all right. And you'll remain seated as we go to the throne of grace. Dear God, we come to you this morning confessing, professing that we love you more than anything else. It's not just words, but it is, Lord, a commitment to you that we give up our will for your will. We surrender our way to your way. We submit and surrender our opinions to your word because we love you more than anything else so we are reminded this morning in this corporate worship that we come to praise you we come to worship you although things may not be going as well as we want them to go we come to praise you Health may not be where we want our health to be, but we come to give you praise. Maybe our dreams, maybe our expectations have really disappointed and, and really not gone exactly the way we want them to go, but Lord, we still come to praise you. Maybe we had a death to come into our rank and just snatch somebody out of our family, but we come still to praise you because we love you more than anything else. Maybe we don't have as much as we used to have, but Lord, we thank God for what we have. Because you are a provider. You are a way maker. Somebody said you're the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Somebody said you're a rose of Sherrod. Wheel in the middle of a wheel. Bread when we get hungry water when we get thirsty and even if i need a good physician you are a great physician lord we love you more than anything else we trust in you we depend upon you we rely upon you more than anything else and lord we come praising you because you're worthy of all the praise bless now lord 
those in the radio listening audience those in the pew those in the streaming live congregation bless now lord bless our children bless teenagers bless our youth bless those young adults middle age or golden ages bless now lord as only you can bless those in hospitals and nursing home bless now lord those in hospitals and icus and cc bless now lord only you can bless you can touch where no doctors can touch bless now lord bless us with peace that surpasses all understanding bless now lord those will be going back into the classrooms educators administrators parents and students bless now lord with a mind that you are the one who can protect mind that you're the one that will give them everything that they need bless now bless every school in the muskogee county school system and beyond Bless our world, bless our nation, bless, bless our state, bless our city. And Lord, we just bless those who've had the vaccine and those who have not. Help us not demonize those who have made choices to not. But Lord, we pray that you will bring them to a reality as you brought many to a reality that 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 there is a community that we're all accountable to and so lord we pray whenever they make that decision of whether they not we still know that you love them and we must love them too and so lord help this not be a divisive issue keep us in the palm of your hands and we'll continue to lift you up, give you all the praises, honor, and glory. Bless this church. Keep us close together. Help us not to stray. And even if we stray, bring us close back to you and bring straying sheep back to the fold. Keep all of us in the palm of your hands. It's in the precious and glorious name of Jesus we lift this prayer up to you. In the name of Jesus. Let every heart and mind say amen. Amen. And amen.
Let's give God worship. Let's worship. Let's worship. Hallelujah. Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. How many believe he's worthy of worship? Hallelujah. How many believe that God, Jesus Christ, God in flesh, yeah. is worth worship? Worthy. So if you believe that, then you don't mind giving him praise. You don't Amen. mind signifying to somebody that I believe Hallelujah. that he is worth He's worship. Worthy. Worthy, worthy of worship. To God yeah. be the glory. He is worth all of Hallelujah. the praise. Thank you, choir, for reminding us that he is worthy yeah 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 he is worthy he's worthy thank you for reminding us here in the sanctuary those in the live streaming congregation those in the radio listening audience for he is worthy i want to go to an old testament passage of scripture this morning and I want to remind us, and parents, I want, if you have your children here, if you have your children near you in the radio listening audience or in the live streaming congregation, I want to remind us of what they taught us at one time in school. And we were brought up under this code of ethics, these guidelines. But as we grew spiritually, we came to understand, or we've come to understand, a deeper meaning of what we were taught early on in our learning. Unfortunately, this is no longer taught. And if anybody should remind us of what the Word of God says and to help bring about understanding it should be the church but it starts at home the church reinforces what the parents who have been entrusted with children to teach them under the nurture and the admonition of the Lord so I just want to come to remind us today of this teaching that God gave to Moses to teach the children of Israel these what is called Ten Commandments the Decalogue God's testimony God's law and understand there were various laws in the Old Testament the prophets prophecies but I want to focus our attention on this so if we can turn to Exodus chapter number 20 and I'm going to ask the media ministry if they would be prepared when we get ready I'm going to use the model to try and help uh, us establish a framework of thinking a frame of reference that will help us look at where we are in our growth spiritually amen and I'm going to be asking you to ask the question, which one are you? Amen. So here, I want to read from the King James translation, Exodus 20, starting with verse number 3 and going to verse number 17. Amen. Starting with verse number 3, our text, sermon text verses will be 12 through 17, but I want to look at the scripture verses that has been recorded here, many ascribe to Moses. Listen at what it says, and if you have your device, you can turn them on, whatever it is, smartphones, iPhones, iPads, if you have a hard copy, I wanna ask you to just follow along. Listen at what it says. Verse number three. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do it all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, thou, thou not thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maid servants, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is written within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that it in, all that them is, in them is and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maid's manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Amen. When was the last time you read that? When, when was the last time you read it to your daughter's son, your grandson? granddaughter. When the last time you read it to each other? So today I want to use as a sermon title, how does the natural, carnal, religious, spiritual immature, spiritually maturing person see the commandments of God? How does the natural, carnal, religious, spiritual immature, spiritual maturing person, see the commandments of God. So let me just quickly run through the model. Is that all right? So let me just ask the media ministry if they would just show us the natural person. The natural person, if you would see on the model, self is on the throne. The plus represents the cross, represents Christ, which is outside of the circle, which means that this person is spiritually dead. This is the unsaved person. This is the person who has no spiritual connection with God through Jesus Christ, not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Their major focus is accumulating the attractions of the world, which really becomes detractions, okay? So this is the natural person. This person, when you speak of spiritual things, that person believes that they're foolishness. Amen? So let's go to the carnal person. Really one and the same, but for teaching purposes, I want to just separate out. Okay? But this is the person also who is actually religious. This is the person who say that they believe in God through Jesus Christ. That's why you see the cross inside the circle, but you see self is still on the throne. This person does not truly believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of their lives. They just basically have a profession. But it's not exemplified through their life. So look at what this person who looks religious, but look at what their focus is still on, still on the things that the natural person focuses on. They come to church, they read the Bible, many of them, they sing in choirs, they sit in pews, they, even some of them serve in deacon's ministry, they serve in deacon wives ministry, they serve in usher's ministries, they serve in all kinds of ministry in the church. They really believe they're saved. 
but they're only religious. They just go through the motion. The word has no impact upon them. So this is a person. Remember, self is still on the cross. This plus is inside the circle. But their major focus, agenda, priority are on accumulating the things of the world. They are worldly still. That's the carnal person. Really the unsaved person. And then you have the spiritually immature person. Look at where the cross is now. Look at where Christ is. Christ is sitting on this person's throne. Self has been dethroned. Look at where the focus is. The focus has changed. The person's priorities have changed. The person's agenda has changed. This person is the, is the baby Christian. They still have some carnality, but they are not carnal to the point that they are living carnally. They are growing and maturing in the word, the will, and the way of God. They are baby Christians. Amen? So this is the baby Christian, the spiritually immature person. Let's go to the maturing person, the spiritually maturing person. This is a spiritually maturing person. Look at where self is. It's outside of the circle. This is the person who truly began to evidence what Christ said, deny yourself daily. Pick up your cross and follow me. So look at where the cross is. Look at where Christ is. Sits on the throne of this person's life. This person really evidence that Jesus Christ is truly the Lord of their lives. They are not perfect by no means. But they are saints who will sin. But they're saints. They're not sinners living in sin. Make the distinction. Okay. And so they are continuing to grow in the will, the way, and the word of God. They are truly walking by faith and not by what they feel, not by what they, their emotions, because the natural person, their choices and decisions are based upon their emotions and their feelings. The, 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 the carnal religious person, even though they look saved, but their choices and decisions are based upon their emotions and their feelings. The spiritually, the baby Christian, the spiritually immature person, they're not void of emotions. They're not void of feelings, but they are growing in faith. Faith began to transcend their feelings and their emotions. And then the spiritually maturing person, this person is continuing to grow and mature in the will, the way, and the word of God, walking by faith and not walking by what they truly feel. But they will feel and they will have emotions. But they allow the Holy Spirit to, to control them, not their emotions and their feelings. So that's, I, I just ask as we go through this, which one are you? Just do the examination. But I do want to just make it very clear as you have and I have read the Decalogue from Exodus 20. The, the, the Old Testament the Ten Commandments. But I want to be very clear. The Ten Commandments are not our Savior. Jesus the Christ is. And as a code of ethics, the Ten Commandments promoted during that time allegiance to God and commanded moral uprightness. You have to understand before the children of Israel would go into the promised land, God told Moses to give them the Ten Commandments because God wanted them to not get seduced, did not want them to get influenced by the nations that already lived in the promised land, the Jubasites. The Edomites, the Canaanites, he was teaching them how to relate to him and how he wanted them to relate one to another. And so there was, God wanted them to have an allegiance. Don't have any other God before me. I'm the one and only true God of Israel. And he wanted them to really be a holy nation that they would be an example to other nations. But I just want to come by and just remind us today because I want to just really clear the air 
because you've got some church folk out there, hopefully not in here, that still believe that they're under the law, that they can keep the law. They still believe that the Ten Commandments, I'm not saying that the Ten Commandments are not still applicable to us, but I do want to under, you to understand that Jesus the Christ has fulfilled the commandments. So I want us to understand that no man, no woman is good enough morally to save him or herself. Doesn't matter how good you say you might you you are, doesn't you can keep all the commandments. It still does not save you at one iota. Listen to what Romans 3.23 says. We all sin. We all have come short of the glory of God. We all need the forgiveness of sin. Not found in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Ten Commandments were established to expose sin. Never to offer the kind of salvation that only Jesus can offer. Then look at what John 8.24 says. John 8.24 tells us to be saved we must believe not in the Ten Commandments but believe in Jesus as the Christ as Savior and Lord. Then Acts chapter 17 verses 30 through 31 tells us Repent of our sins. That means to turn away. That means to turn away from our sin. Turn to God. And then Romans 10, 9 says, it tells us, confess Jesus Christ as what? As Lord. As Lord. And Acts 2, 38 tells us, be baptized in the name of the Lord for the remission of sin. So the Ten Commandments does not save anybody. And I know as children, many of us learn the Ten Commandments as basic morality lessons. A list of do's and don'ts. But let me just tell you how the natural person sees them. The natural kind of religious person sees them exactly as rules and guidelines not as relationship. If you look at the first four of the Ten Commandments that I read, it was dealing with how God wanted his people to relate to him. It was not based on do's and don'ts. It was not based on restrictions. It was based upon that God wanted them to know before they went into the promised land how he wanted them to relate to him. But we have carnal and we have natural persons in today's culture who believe that they can be good enough to please God. Keep telling you, goodness will never get anyone into heaven. So number one, the natural carnal religious person saw the first four commandments as restrictive as restrictive and I know I may be talking to someone on, in the radio listening audience I may be talking to someone in the live streaming congregation and possibly talking to someone right now and they still hold a perspective or an, an understanding or viewpoint that 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 the law was restrictive as opposed to relational even in the Old Testament so if you look at, again, what the law, the Ten Commandments, God was saying to the children of Israel, you shall have no other gods before me. He was talking about allegiance. That's relational. Relate to me as the one and only true God. Even though you may be among other gods that will be served, and even today we have that. There's a lot of people who still have gods, and idol gods in their lives. They worship 
idol gods. You can figure out <laughs> what the idol gods are. Then he said, you shall not worship idols or make graven images. Then he says, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall keep the Sabbath holy. Now, for some of those who still believe that the Sabbath day for the Christian is Sunday, it, I mean, it's Saturday, it is not. For the Christian, it is the first day of the week. Because we believe in a living Savior. And I don't get into a, a real heavy debate with people who still believe that we're supposed to observe the Sabbath. Because, again, of the Old Testament, and I'll show you where Jesus said otherwise. All right? The Sabbath was for the nation of Israel. The Hebrew people of that time. They were not to do any work. They were not to do anything on the Sabbath. They were to keep it holy. That was true. But today, who is our Sabbath? Jesus the Christ. He is our Sabbath. Where was Jesus on Friday? Come close. He was dying on a cross for you and for me. Shedding innocent blood to atone for the sins that, had, that Adam had committed. Adam in the Garden of Eden committed, disobeyed God. And because of his disobedience, we all were separated from God. And it's through Jesus the Christ, he came to die on a cross, to shed innocent blood, to atone for our sins. Where, we, where, where was Jesus on Saturday? Where was Jesus on the Sabbath, according to the Old Testament law? He was in a grave. He was in a tomb. He was dead. Now, here's the question that I ask everybody who want to hold to the Sabbath still is a practice. Are you worshiping and serving a dead Savior, dead Lord, or you're worshiping and serving an alive Savior and Lord? Where was Jesus on Sunday? I can quit right here because I love early. Huh? Look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it says that he was raised from the dead early on Sunday, the first day of the week. So the question is, do you serve, do you worship, do you believe in a living Lord and Savior? I don't have to get into a lot of debates. I know those who will hear me are going to question. They're going to say, well, he's teaching heresy. But I'm just talking about what the Bible says. The only thing you have to do, it depends upon, again, if you are looking at it from a natural, carnal perspective, viewpoint. Because the natural and the carnal, they have, they cannot discern spiritual truth because it's spiritual but let me show you what the spiritually immature began to learn as that spiritually immature baby is born again under the word of God and the act of the Holy Spirit that spiritually maturing person who are work, who are who, who's growing in the will the way and the word of God they go to Matthew 22 37 you remember what the Pharisee raised the question to Jesus. Say, Jesus, what is the greatest of the law? It's there. Jesus says, the greatest of the law. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all of your strength. That was the first one. He took the first four and wrapped it into the one. It was relational. He says, you are to love God with all of your being, the every fiber you have in your body, in your mind, in your soul, in your strength. You love God. Didn't y'all just sing a song? I love him 
more than anything else? Isn't that what they just, okay? And you all were singing and raising your hand, I love you, Jesus. Isn't that what y'all, you know, Holy Spirit moving in this place. Jesus said, these are the greatest two. Here's the first one. Jesus is God in flesh. He will never contradict God the Father, ever. You can look at it from Genesis to Revelation. He will never contradict because Jesus is God. He says, love God with everything. Then he says, here's number two. He said, the laws and the prophecies hangs on these two. He took two of the commandments and condensed everything else from the Old Testament. He says, this is how you're going to tell whether a person loved God with all his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength, or whether she loved God with all her soul, her mind, her strength, with her heart. This is how you're going to be measured. He said, here's the greatest of the commandments. Here's number, the greatest of the commandment number two. The spiritually immature person learns to, to really begin to trust began to, to believe in what the word says. The spiritual maturing person not only believes, but began to evidence because they cannot do it in, in and of them themselves. It's only done when a person is born again spiritually and is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. He says, here's how I'm going to measure whether you truly love God with all you have. Love your neighbor. As yourself. That's it for the for the Christian. He says a new commandment. You can go over to John 14, 32, 34. He said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love you one another as I have loved you. And by this the whole world will know you belong to me. You are truly his disciple. So, so, so what's, what's the law for the Christian today? What, what is the law for the Christian today? It's the law of love. It's the law of love. So when I am practicing the law of love, I'm not going to murder. When I practice the law of love, I'm not stealing from my neighbor. When I practice the law of love, I'm not coveting what my neighbor has. When I practice the law of love, there's no other God that I will ever bow to. I love him more than anything else. That's even me. But if you have a uh, natural Carn a carnal, you're still thinking like the world, this makes no sense. Because see, the natural person is spiritually dead. The word of God has no impact on a natural person unless the Holy Spirit convicts that person that he or she is a sinner and needs a Savior and a Lord in his or her life. It can come no other way. That's why Jesus said to uh, uh, Nicodemus, you must be. You've got to be born again. He didn't say you got to be good. He said you've got to be spiritually born again. How? From above. From God. Now the word of God and act of the Holy Spirit, it's not based upon rules and regulations. It's not based upon me being good enough. It's not based, a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't steal, I don't curse, I stop stealing, I stop cursing. That's all good. But the question is, do you know Jesus? Do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? And if there is a true conversion, I don't do what I used to do. But here's the real hope in all of this. The real hope in all of this is that when I do sin, the Holy Spirit will convict me. Yeah. Tell me I am wrong. Yeah. And I'll go to that person if I've sinned against, I've offended, and I'll ask for forgiveness. If that person comes to me, 
No matter how egregious the act or the behavior or the offense is, I am, as because he's Lord of my life, he's commanded me to forgive him. So the second point that I want to make the spiritually immature and the spiritually maturing person come to see the first four commandments in the Old Testament as Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, the spiritually maturing person embraces. That becomes the belief that is practice. And it's shown in how that person priorities, how that person's agenda, how that person's uh, 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 focus change. But if they're just religious, they'll say it. But they'll never have time, not only for God, they'll never have time for their family, they'll never have time for worship, they'll never have time to study his word, they'll never have time because they keep on pursuing the attractions of the world. The spiritually immature, spiritually maturing person come to understand and believe that the first four was actually a summary of the commandments and relationship. It was about relationship. God wanted relationship with his people. The same way he wants relation with you now. Those of, who have been baptized, regenerated, believers in Jesus Christ. Not rules of do's and don't. Religious people, carnal people, live by legalism, rules and regulations. And if anybody break the rules and regulations, here's how you know that they don't love God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, or they don't love their neighbor as themselves. They become very condemning and judgmental. Now let me just go ahead and say something because some people say, well, you can't judge me. But when a person loves God with all their fiber, all their strength, a person truly loves their neighbor as themselves, they will correct because they don't want that person to continue to live either in sin or to walk down a road of destruction. They will correct them in love. They will correct them in gentleness. They will correct them in kindness. They have come to understand that no matter how harsh they speak, no matter how brutal they speak, no matter how, 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 how commanding they are, the only one that will change the heart is the Holy Spirit. You use the word to help correct. Not to condemn, but to correct. Not to punish, but to discipline. And we as Christians, spiritual maturing, those who are learning, who are immature, that the word of God, the law, is the law of love. And so, number three, the natural carnal religious person see the six through ten commandments in the Old Testament as prohibitive, restrictive, still looking at them as rules and regulations, re uh, not understanding that God wanted not only them to relate to him, to reverence him, to honor him, and in the Hebrew, honor means that you will give weight to the instructions, to the direction, and to the advice of the one you reverence. So God was saying he wanted them to not only have allegiance to him, he not only wanted them to honor him, not only wanted them to obey him, but when they went into the promised land that he will have more weight than any other idol gods. That's what Jesus is saying to us who are believers today. He carries more weight than you. His word carries more weight than you. His word and the Holy Spirit will influence you that when you're doing wrong, it's not that I'm saying, well, you know, uh, it's my life and I can do whatever I want. No, you're wrong. It's not your life. It's his that he's entrusted to you to live 
if you are saved the way he's instructed you to live. And when there are those who keep saying, well, I'm my own person, I'm my own body, I'm my own woman, I'm my own man, you are truly deceived. So you don't belong to yourself. I bought you with a price. I'm the one that died on a cross. I'm the one that shed in innocent blood. I'm the one that forgave you for your sins. You belong to me. The spiritually immature, the spiritually maturing person begins to believe that, embrace that, and live that. They begin to live in a humbled way. So here's number four. This is the last one. The spiritually immature, spiritually maturing person, this is the contrast, come to understand and believe the commandments when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? The spiritually immature person would say everybody as they come to learn and understand. The spiritually maturing person began to obey it and showing that everybody is his or her neighbor. Even those who may not belong to the body of Christ is your neighbor. You love them. Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. We know that that's the golden rule, don't we? Well, that's one of the greatest of the commandments. Your wife is your neighbor. Your husband is your neighbor. Your mother, your father, sister, your brother, children. Those in the church, those who are homeless, those who are helpless, those who may not know Christ, you treat them as your neighbor. Now I know today we have neighbors we don't like. Got people we got that live right next door to us. We work with them on our job. We know they, we, and I just say to people, and I'm going to say, you know what the spirit, you know what the natural person says, you know, the, 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 the spirit, the, 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 the carnal person says, Rev, I can love them, but I just don't like them. That's like an oxymoron. Big shrimp. Pretty ugly. It makes no sense. You know what the spiritually immature person began to learn and grow? You know what the spiritually maturing person began to learn when he says, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. How can you not l like them when you say you love them? It makes no sense. I, I like my boss, but I, I love my boss, but I don't like him. I, I like my boss, I just don't love him or her. Makes no sense. Not for the Christian. I can understand when a person says to me, I love this person, but I don't like their ways. Don't like their attitude. Don't like how they come across. Then, then, then you keep loving them. Pull them aside and tell them about the things that you don't like. But don't tell them that I love you, but I sure don't like you. But listen to what Jesus says, and I'm done. The spiritually immature and the spiritually maturing person come to understand this to its deepest core. When Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 he did not come to destroy or to abolish the law he came that the law might be fulfilled that's why we're no longer under the law of the Old Testament when you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ it is not your righteousness that makes you right. It is his righteousness. And because he has fulfilled the law, when you have a love, trust, obedient relationship with God through Jesus Christ, guess what you fulfill? 
you fulfill the law, not in your own strength, but in your relationship and your faith and your trust in Jesus the Christ. And when you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you're no longer under a got to mentality because that is a law mentality. But you're under a desire mentality. That means that I desire to please my Savior and my Lord. So if he tells me to forgive my enemies, then it's not a debate. It's not an entertainment of whether I will or not. He says, do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's not talking about the Old Testament law. He's talking about those two over in Matthew 22, 37 and verse 39. Love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, your strength. Love God with everything you have. That cannot happen without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, this is how I'm going to measure it. I'm going to measure it by you, how you treat other people. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. He said, how can you say you love God? Who have you never seen? And you see your neighbor, you see your brothers and your sisters all the time. And you say you hate them, you don't like them, you don't love them. He said that person is a liar. Read it. It's in 1 John chapter 5 verse 20. Read it. It's there. Take your children there. Read it to them. How can I say that I'm working with another person and that person just gets on my nerve. That person really just gets me to the, get my blood just rising. Jesus says, how do you know that I can have control of you? I've produced my self-control in you when you don't want to engage with that person. Trying to avoid them all the time. How do you know you have patience if you're not tested with people who cause you to be impatient how do you know the patience that the only the Holy Spirit will produce in you how will you know you have the unconditional love of Christ if you don't have people in your life that that really challenge your love for them We have to revisit and be reminded of what the Word of God says. Not, in, not only in terms of the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. So that we can see the progressive revelation that God himself is disclosing. And those who are in Christ, in Christ in them, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, he's the one that gives spiritual discernment. He don't want us in bondage. He says, I've liberated you. i freed you to love the way that I loved you. And I've given you a helper. His name is the Holy Spirit. So a spiritually immature person, as they are learning to be sensitive to the help of the Holy Spirit, the spiritually maturing person is learning and continuing to grow in the, in the spirit. Then when you come up against the challenges of life, then you will come to be yielded to the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit and he's the one that will live it out through you he'll change your mind change how you see things change how you relate to people he don't have a word I can't in his vocabulary nor in his children only the natural carnal person keeps saying I can't forgive I can't love him anymore I can't I can't I can't. They may have hurt you to the core of your heart. But the only way that God knows and he wants you to know because God is omniscient but he wants to expose to you his power, his presence. He wants to expose to you whether you really need to grow continuously because sometimes I want to think that I can really love as long as I don't have to do it. I can love Jackie as long as Jackie don't challenge. <laughs> I can love her. I can say I love her. But when she don't do what I want her to do, then the proof is in the pudding. I'm done. Which one are you? The natural 
the carnal religious person, spiritually immature person, or the spiritually mature in person? Which one are you? The one thing that my prayer is that people who are coming, members who are coming to the Fourth Street Missionary Baptist Church, that you are not self-deceived. That we think we're something that we're not. Because it's very easy. It's very easy. It's very easy to come in and out of the church. It's very easy to sing in the choir. It's very easy to serve in the pulpit, preach in the pulpit. It's very easy to serve in every ministry in the church. But the question becomes, how do you treat the person that you're serving in the ministry with? How do you treat the people who may not do it the way you like it's done? How do you treat people? That's the bottom line that God is looking at. Whether they upset you or not, nobody said you, didn't, you can't get upset. Nobody said that. It's what you do when you get upset. That becomes the litmus test, y'all. And I tell you, here's the great example. I'm going I'm to show you the one who went to a hill called Calvary. His name is Jesus. He's our prime example. He says, a new commandment I give unto you. He ushered in a new covenant. He, he gave us a better covenant than the old covenant. And he showed how we are to relate to those who will be cruel to us. Those who will crucify us. Those who will even try and kill us. And if you're a disciple of Christ, you follow his model. He's the one that went to a hill called Calvary on a Friday over 2,000 years ago. He's the one that gave his hands to the nails because he wasn't going to retaliate or fight them back. He's the one that gave his feet to the nails because he was going to say, I'm not going to run from you. I'm not going to try and escape. He's the one that says, if I be lifted up, I'm going to do the drawing. All men and women, boys and girls, Jews and Gentiles, up unto me. He's the one. Even hanging on that cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you not know Jesus could have called a legion of angels to his rescue? Do you know what a legion of angels? Do you know what a legion in terms of the elite army of the Roman Empire? Do you know how many a legion of angels actually meant? It meant 6,000 elite soldiers, the best trained. Do you not know he could have called a legion, 6,000 angels to his rescue? And yet he said, Father, forgive give them he could have dropped a tear washed the whole world away and yet he died son refused to shine while the son the son was glorifying his father on a cross he didn't run from the cross he went to the cross and he says it's finished I'm taking on the condemnation of God. That's why he says those are in him are no longer under any condemnation. Isn't that good news? He says, I'm taking on the wrath of God. That's why I don't have to fear the wrath of God when I die. It's not because I've been so good under a law. It's not because I kept all the law. You better make sure. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And nobody gets to heaven. Nobody gets to God unless they come and believe in Jesus the Christ. Be good all you want to be. But if you die, you good self going to hell. We got to preach truth. So there is hope in Jesus the Christ. He did die, y'all. He died. Yes, he did. Where a Roman soldier said, surely this must be, this got to be the son of God. And I'm glad Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate, requested Jesus' body, put it in a borrowed tomb. Anything that's borrowed has got to be take, given back, right? In other words, Jesus says, I'm not, I'm not going to keep this long. I'm going to give it back. I'm going to stay here all Friday night. Because God promised, if you tear this temple down, I'm going to raise it in three days. I'm going to stay here all Saturday night. 
I'm going to stay here all, I'm going to stay here all Saturday, all Saturday night. But here's the third day, fulfillment of the promise, which simply means that Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by God. If it had not been accepted by God, he never would have raised him. But early Sunday morning, some people get happy because they understand the hope of his salvation. Some people understand early Sunday morning. I didn't say early Saturday morning. I didn't say late Saturday night. I didn't say early Friday noon. I said early Sunday morning. He was raised from the dead with all power. Resurrection power, saving power, fulfillment power. He fulfilled the prophecies and the law. Loving power. Walked around for 40 days showing himself to his disciples, proving that God's promise is true. Proving that God's power is absolutely real. Sit upon the right hand throne of the Father and that's where he is now. Interceding for every believer. But here's what's going to happen. One of these old days he's going to come back again. Until then he's giving every believer a helper to help you live the Christian life. Not under the bondage of the law but under the freedom of the law of love, under the law of forgiveness, grace, mercy. He loves you enough that he made a way back to God through the cross, through shed blood. Those who will come and sincerely believe in him will have eternal life. Ain't that good news, y'all? There's hope in Jesus. And I don't know where you are in the Streaming Life congregation. If you still are under the mentality that you can, for some reason, somehow, satisfy the law of the Old Testament, no wonder you are full of guilt. No wonder you are so full of insecurity. Because you're under a bondage, you're under slavery of the law. But Jesus says, the truth shall set you free. And when the Son of Man sets you free, you're free indeed. And he's the truth. And I want to invite you to believe in the truth of Jesus Christ. We invite you, we open up the door of the church. And you can come down the aisle right now and say, I want to be freed from this law mentality. I want to be under the law of love, the law of Jesus the Christ. I want to be in a love, trust, obedient relationship with Jesus. You can come right now. Those in the streaming live congregation, call this number 706-324-2055 and let them know that you are a believer in Jesus the Christ. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, believe sincerely in your heart that Jesus the Christ is Lord and God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Rescued from the penalty of sin. Rescued from the authority, the power of sin. And one day you'll be rescued from the presence of sin. Will you come right now? Those in the pew, the opportunity to believe and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's calling you now. Maybe you've been searching. You've been going from one church to another. Or maybe you haven't. And you say, once I get the opportunity to come into the Lord's house, I'm not going to pass up this opportunity to be restored back unto Christ. I'm not going to, to be in fellowship with him. We offer that to you today. You can unite here at the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church where you can continue to grow in the will, the way, and the word of God. So I want to invite you right now. Maybe you moved to the city because of military relocation, maybe a military reassignment or a job relocation, a job reassignment. We want to invite you to come and unite here at the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church where you can grow in the will, the way, and the word of God. Will you come right now? The door of the church is open unashamed unembarrassed God loves you but God is a just God because if you die out of the ark of safety he will judge the Bible says there's a point in time for every person to die and then the judgment 
the question is whether you will appear before the great white throne of God or whether you will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you said the great white throne of God, you need to run down the aisle. Only sinners, unbelievers, will appear before the great white throne of God. But those who are saved will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's good news, y'all. Come on, come on. He's open. If you're looking to recommit and rededicate your life to Christ, you can do that today. Shoulder it up. I'm going home to Jesus. Ain't that good news? Don't play with him now. Hallelujah, that's a good news. I don't know about you. Thank you, Jesus, that's a good news. Can't go there under the law. Yeah. Only through Jesus Christ. And I'm going home to Jesus. Ain't that good news. Anybody help today? Anybody challenge today? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've come to that time for worship and giving. And when you truly want to please God, guess what you're going to do? You're going to give generously. Not because anybody manipulated, tried to coerce you, or tried to make you. No. God loves a cheerful giver. Is there anybody in this house? When he blesses us, he wants us to be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. So we want to give you an opportunity to bring the tithe and the offering. For those who go online, that's one way that you can go online to bring the tithe and the offering. You can go to your device right now. Go to GiveLify. You can go to the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church. Look for the crib, the cross, and the empty tomb and make your tithe and offering contributions right now. We'll give you time. Whether you got your cell phone, iPhone, smartphone, iPad, whatever device you have, you can go online right now. If you choose not to go online, then I would ask if you did not have the opportunity to drop your tithe envelope in the tithing boxes out front. I want to ask if you would raise your hand. The ushers will give you a tithing envelope and you can designate your tithe and your offering on the tithing envelope. We ask that you would make sure that your name and your address, every all the updated information, make sure that you place it on the tithing envelope and then as you're exiting the sanctuary, you can drop it in the tithing box outside. If you choose not to go online, if you choose not to talk drop it in the tithing box today then take the envelope fill it out when you get home and you can drop it off through the weekday Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. drop it in the educational building drop box inside of the educational building we continue to ask you to wear your mask practice five to six feet distancing but also on Saturday from 9 to 1 you can also drop it off same place Please wear your mask and practice five to six feet distancing. If you choose not to go online to bring your tithe and offering or drop it off during the week or drop it off before you leave in the tithing boxes, then you can mail it in. Take that tithing envelope, make sure the appropriate information is there, put it in a self, put it in an addressed envelope, address it to the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church, P.O. Box 1591, Columbus, Georgia, 31901. We ask that you would use whatever way you choose to use to bring the tithe and the offering and we thank God for you. We pray God's blessings be upon you. Dear Lord, we thank you for these who would come and they would give generously because we believe that you're a generous God. We believe Jesus is a generous Savior, Lord. We believe the Holy Spirit is a, a generous Holy Spirit. And because we're connected with God through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're guided to be generous people and being obedient unto you. Now we ask that you will bless the givers, bless their families, bless their home, bless their health and their strength. Continue to provide for their every need according to their, your riches and glory. We ask that you will continue to allow us to be good stewards over that you will entrust unto us. That we will be able to use it to continue to advance your kingdom, giving you glory, honor, and praise. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. 
amen god bless you god keep you as our prayer let me just say to the deacons and the deacon wives who were part of yesterday the ushers uh also the food ministry the hope of the house of hope um and, and those who were a part of the food giveaway yesterday in oakland park we was in oakland park yesterday giving food away we walked the neighborhood lifting up jesus the christ we partnered with um, um uh, one of the churches there um Ashbury United Methodist Church, Pastor Powell, and we went and we prayed for uh, Key Elementary so that they would have, uh, they would be dedicated and they, they will have safety as their students come back and administrators and the teachers. And we're praying for all the schools, we're praying for all the educators as well as administrators, uh, but we were asking, so we were very thankful that we could go in that community and let them see Christ through us. We also had those available. We've partnered with uh, Valley Health, um, community um, health center and they had uh, available um, vaccines yesterday uh, again let me just make sure I want to give our position we are about making access well the person it's like a bank you know having an ATM machine everybody don't use the ATM machine but you have access to it and so we want to make sure that those who will decide and choose that they will have access. It's like giving food away. Everybody didn't come and get food yesterday, but they had access to it. And so I want to make sure that we don't be positioned in a way in terms of, you know, we got to make one stance or another. You know, we're just saying that whatever decision a person makes, we're going to love them anyway. We just thank all of y'all for wearing your mask. If you didn't get vaccinated, we're not going to tell you you can't come to worship. If you got your vaccination, we're going to tell you, God bless you. But we are going to say to every person that enters those doors, wear your mask, get your temperature taken, follow the instructions of the seating. That goes for everybody. And we thank God for you all doing it. Amen. So let us not in the church be divided. You can have whatever opinion you want, but at the end of the day, we all are connected through Jesus the Christ. And so I'm thankful for those who have come to that deeper understanding that I can deal work with you whether, if, whether you got vaccinated or not. That's not going to deter whether I work with you, serve with you, and all of that. Amen? So I want to make sure you all are clear about where I am standing. Amen. Because the Bible says you got to love everybody. And I do. But I can say it. But if I don't practice it, then it becomes a contradiction. Amen. So I thank you, Fourth Street. We're going to stand to our feet. Let me just ask you to do this. All the men who came yesterday, we had maybe 15 to 20 men. And they came at 8 o'clock. We're studying the book, How to Be a Godly Man. And I thank Brother Jerome White for his leading in that, giving, exam, giving, the, lecture, giving the, the class yesterday. It happened every fourth Saturday at 8 a.m. If you want to learn how to become a godly man, not a worldly man, because we can be a man and not be godly. We can be a man and not be Christ-like. But we want to teach what the characteristics of a godly man looks like. So our young boys will be following not just men, they will be following godly, Christ-like men. And so please engage every fourth Saturday at 8 a.m. We're back person to person. Amen. Thank you men for what you did on yesterday. It was a tremendous show of your presence. Very powerful. Those who were not able to make it yesterday, God bless you. We'll, take you. we'll see you on the next one. Amen. So there's another opportunity. Dear Gracious Father, we thank you so very much for what we've heard and what we've seen through your word. We pray it does not fall on stony ground. It'll penetrate, it'll penetrate someone's heart and mind to cause them to examine where they truly are in terms of their growth in their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That they not just stay natural or they not just stay carnal, but they have a desire and they become available to the convicting of the Holy Spirit that they will become a baby in Christ and not just stay a baby in Christ but they will grow in the will, the way, and the word of God 
that they will practice the love of Christ. Now, Lord, we ask you to dismiss us from this place, but never from your grace. It's in the precious and glorious name of Jesus from whom all blessings flow. Follow the instructions of the ushers. Those on my left go. Thank you for joining us. We pray that you were encouraged, inspired, and yes, even convicted to believe in Jesus the Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and that you will give Christ your life. We want you to know that he desires a love, trust, obedient relationship with you because he loves you and we here at the fourth street missionary baptist church love you too we want you to know that here at the fourth street missionary baptist church you can come again and you can join us in worship bible study and we also have other ministries through helping us to continue to grow in the will and the way of the Word of God through our virtual and through our Facebook Live and through Zoom. We want you to know that you can find out more about us at our website at the number 4 THST.org the number 4 THST.org or you can call us at 706-324 2055 706-324-2055 we want you to know you're always welcome god bless you god keep you is our prayer thank you